Hello again. I uh, appreciate you coming back and viewing this video. If you haven't uh, watched the previous videos, I would highly recommend that you go back and watch the previous three or four videos that I've made before you get to this one. Not that you can't watch it, but it would help you out quite a bit. Um, again, a disclaimer here. Um, I'm not a professional uh, videographer or YouTuber or whatever. I'm just really concerned about Americans, um, you know, and their false ideas of what, you know, that they're free and that the government is usurping power when it's them uh, individually who have contracted themselves into a commercial law neo-feudal bond servitude by consent, application, participation, receipt of benefits uh, financed by monetary uh, monetized debt through the Federal Reserve Fifth Plank Banking Central Banking System. So uh, from the last video, I ended on uh, and showed you how all 10 planks of Marxist Communist Manifesto, how the United States has implemented into U.S. law by either uh, constitutional amendment or act of Congress, uh, and then uh, executive branch regulation, uh, the 10 planks. Uh, so if you're interested in how you became communist back in the New Deal era, in the 1930s and 40s, and how from that point forward you've been communist since, and you've just been marching towards a totalitarian police uh, despotism tyranny. Uh, go back and watch the previous video. And I'd highly recommend watching the ones before that as well. This is kind of a multi-part mini-series story about how you became enslaved uh, by your own consent. So in the, in the, in the uh, 10 Planks video, you know, we noticed how uh, just about every plank uh, has to do with commerce. And what most people don't realize is commerce is ruled under a jurisdiction of a different form of law than what uh, most people think. Um, and this law is constitutional. It's embedded in the Constitution. It was recognized uh, by the, con the drafters of the Constitution as being part of the American jurisprudence system. It was brought here, and we'll read this, I don't want to get too far ahead, uh, you know, by British settlers. And it's an ancient form of law. It's been around for a very, very long time. In its kind of modern uh, form, it goes back to the Isle of Rhodes uh, back in uh, uh, B.C. times. So, but it wasn't, it didn't start in Rhodes. It goes even back further, but that's kind of where our modern form originated from. So this is from a book that I've got up on the uh, shelf up here, but it was easier to put it on the computer screen. Uh, you can see I got several Amjurs, and it's up in one of those uh, Amjur books up there that would cover Admiralty. So uh, maritime law. So let's uh, go through and read this. I've got several uh, quotes to get through uh, for today's uh, segment. American Jurisprudence, 2D, Volume 2, page 720, Admiralty. Section 1, The Origin and Nature of Admiralty Jurisdiction and Practice. The historical development of the Admiralty Jurisdiction and Procedure is of practical as well as theoretical interest since opinions in Admiralty cases frequently refer to the historical background in, re in reaching conclusions on the questions at issue. The special jurisdiction of admiralty has a maritime purpose and is different from common law. It, the admiralty, I added that so people, I don't get confused, I'm not the brightest bulb in the box, is not exclusively rooted in the civil law system, although it includes substantial uh, derivations therefrom. Now let's talk about a couple of things here. Well, let's finish the paragraph first. It has a strong international aspect, but it may undergo independent changes in the several countries that an admiralty law that have an admiralty law, and such international features are given serious consideration by Admiralty Courts. Now, first off, notice that it's difference. Admiralty Maritime, that's kind of, we're going to find out it's going to rule over commerce, is different from the common law. And uh, it, it's not exactly because it originated, it's a system of law that originated 
uh, you know, like I said, in, in this modern um, form, it originated from the Isle of Rhodes. So it's kind of come through time where civil law itself is the law that is um, created by uh, 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 every, every civil law body politic. So the United States, all the U.S. law is civil, U.S. civil law. But within that is Admiralty Maritime Law because Congress has the power over maritime law. So you can see how it's, it, it kind of follows the same kind of, of, of rules, so to speak. Now, the common law, this is what we call the law of the land. This is what was the law of the land. And this Admiralty Maritime, you know, because it has a maritime purpose, was called the law of the sea for a while. So you had these two differences. Now, and we'll see this here uh, as we go on. You'll see how this works out because of the English jurisprudence system that the American system was kind of born from. By the end of the 17th century, the admiralty jurisdiction in England had been restricted until it wasn't as extensive as in other European maritime countries due to a long controversy in which the common law courts, with the aid of Parliament, had succeeded in limiting the jurisdiction of admiralty to the high seas and excluding its jurisdiction from transactions arising on waters within the body of a country. So we see in the English system, before we separated from it, the English common law court versus, you know, the Maritime Court, the Exchequer, the King's Bench, you know, they've got several courts over there. The Common Law Court with Parliament worked together to limit this maritime law to its proper place, to the high seas, or, you know, what most people refer to as the high tide mark. Okay, so now how did we develop this here in the United States? Because once we separated from England, we kind of went our own way. Did we limit it? Mm, you'll find out, no, we did not. In a free country, we want to be able to do whatever we want to do. So the Admiralty Jurisprudence System was brought to America by British settlers, along with the common law and equity. Now, equity is said, just briefly, equity is said to follow the law, both maritime law, uh, admiralty, and common law. Now, what equity does is it gives you a remedy when neither of these forms of law have in it a form of remedy. Now, I'll give you a biblical example that probably most people are familiar with. There was, a, there was the case in the Bible of a story where King Solomon had to decide uh, between uh, two women as to who was the best to raise a child. Both of them claimed to be the mother. One of the babies had died. And now these two women are fighting over this child. Now, what most people miss is there's no mention of which one of these women is the actual mother. What Solomon had to decide, because there's nowhere in the Torah of the Bible that laid out this scenario. There was no remedy provided in the Torah, the law of God given to the Israelites at Mount Sinai. What do you do when two women fight over one baby? Well, because there was no remedy in the law, now it devolves upon equity. So equity kind of follows this idea of what is just, right, and fair. What is in the best interest of that child? That's what Solomon had to ask. So he went about it in a very original way. And not to say that the woman who said cut the baby in half wasn't the mother. We don't know that. There's no express uh, uh, definitive information telling us which one is the mother. Solomon gave the custody of the baby to the woman who wanted to preserve the life of the child, proving that she had the best interest of the child at heart. Therefore, equity devolves custody onto that woman. So that's what equity is. Think of Judge Judy. There's an equity court, Judge Judy. Okay, so the courts for the administration of the maritime law were commissioned in many, if not all, of the colonies. These tribunals continued to exercise of power conferred upon them until the organization of the federal government in 1787. 
Now, before the adoption of the Constitution, jurisdiction in admiralty and maritime cases was distributed between the confederation of the individual states, but when the Constitution of the United States was framed, a system of exclusive federal admiralty jurisdiction was incorporated, placing the entire subject, substantive as well as procedural, under national control because of its intimate relation to navigation and to interstate and foreign commerce. Now, the provision in the Constitution did not abrogate the maritime law theretofore in force. So what was already going on with maritime law in the U.S.? It was just kind of absorbed into federal jurisdiction. The maritime law became law of the United States subject to the paramount power of Congress to alter, quali qualify, or supplant it as experience and changing conditions, that's important, might require, subject only to constitutional and treaty limitations, which is basically everything, you know, that everything's limited by that. Let me scroll down here. This power of Congress is paramount in matters of maritime law, and it was exercised at an early date when Congress enacted the Judiciary Act of 1789, conferring on the federal district courts exclusive jurisdiction of seizures under the law of impost. You ever had any property seized? navigation or trade of the United States and made on navigable waters within the respective districts. Okay, so now early on, we kind of see that it was kind of limited still to the water. But wait, this jurisdiction of admiralty has since been modified and enlarged by numerous enactments. Ouch. So now let me find the next one here, and I think this will kind of help paint this picture a little better. This is from a case called uh, The Propeller, Genesee Chief versus Fitzhugh, 53 U.S. 12 Howe, 443, 443, 1851, and uh, the opinion here is given by Chief Justice Roger Canney. Okay, this power... Congress's power over commerce, which if you look in Article 1, Section 8, it says that Congress has exclusive jurisdiction over interstate and foreign commerce. It has absolute power over that, kids. Okay? And this is all done by contract. This form of law works a lot like martial law. Maritime jurisprudence works a lot like martial law. How does it get in persona jurisdiction? You got a contract into it. Otherwise, you're back in the common law, okay? Law of the land. But can we bring the law of the sea on the land? Let's see if we did that because we're a free country and we want to bring commerce everywhere. So this power over commerce is, is as extensive upon land as upon water. The Constitution makes no distinction in that respect. And if the admiralty jurisdiction in matters of contract ooh, and tort okay so if you're either going to be everything boils down to you know a judge is going they're pretty smart man these guys are not fools american people are a little ignorant but a judge when you when there's a bitch in court he's going to reduce this thing down to two things first off is this a matter dealing with property rights or mere regulation in contract contract. Because if you've got a mere regulation and contract, the con the terms of the contract are what's going to, okay, and what's a tort? Well, a tort isn't a contract. If you violate the terms and conditions of a contract, well, now that's a separate matter. A tort is any wrongdoing outside of a contract, okay? So like if I run into your, your on a, let's say the road's icy, 
and I uh, accidentally, my, my car and I slide off the street and into your porch. Well, we don't have a contract, but that's a tort. I've, 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 uh, I've caused you a damage, and that's, you know, so that would be a tort, okay? All right, so uh, any in matters of contract and tort, which the courts of the United States, all right, so now we're dealing with the United States, not the states, may lawfully exercise on the high seas. So again, remember the origin of this from English law was limited to the high tide mark, okay? But now we're bringing it on land. Can be extended to the lakes. Okay, so now we're talking like the Great Lakes and stuff like that. Under the power to regulate commerce, it can with the same propriety and upon the same construction be extended to contracts and torts on land. When the commerce is between different states and it may embrace also the vehicles and persons engaged in carrying it on. It would be in the power of Congress to confer admiralty jurisdiction upon its courts over the cars engaged in transporting passengers or merchandise from one state to another and over the persons engaged in conducting them and deny to the parties of the trial by jury. Jury trial is a common law thing not commercial maritime law. Now, the judicial power in cases of admiralty and maritime jurisdiction has never been supposed to extend to contracts made on land and to be extended on land. But if the power of regulating commerce can be made the foundation of jurisdiction in its courts in a new and extended admiralty jurisdiction, beyond its heretofore known and admitted limits, may be created on water be, uh, under that authority, the same reason would justify the same exercise of power on land. Courts of admiralty have been found necessary in all commercial countries, not only for the safety and convenience of co commerce, and the speedy decision of controversies where delay would often be ruin, but also to administer the laws of nations in a season of war and to determine the validity of captures and questions of prize or no prize in a judicial proceeding. So, this is very important. In the United States, because we're free, we can take, we can take the maritime law wherever we take commerce. So if that's on the high seas, maritime law. If we bring it beyond the high seas into the rivers and lakes, com and we're doing commerce, there's the maritime law. If we take commerce out of the water and on the land, through a dock, onto rivers of tar and concrete, through trucks and trains, and into Walmart and your local grocery store because everything's coming from all over the world, that's maritime law. So in the United States, the maritime law was never, never, never limited to the high seas. It goes wherever commerce goes. Now, what's important here is that's the subject matter jurisdiction. The maritime law has subject matter jurisdiction over all things commerce and insurance. We'll get to that. But, well, how does it get jurisdiction over the person? Matters of contract. <laughs> like I said, how does a soldier, how does a civilian become subject to the uh, mar uh, martial law of the United States, the UCMJ? Huh? How does that happen? Um, he signs a military enlistment contract. All right, let's see here. What's the next one I want to do? Well, let's do this is another old older case. Judges are always trying to tell us the truth here, kids. You got to pay more attention to your judges. They've been trying to help you since the beginning, and you listen. You listen to lying politicians. Politicians are designed to make you offers through political means, through government, 
to get you to sign up for the benefits. And we'll talk about that here in a minute. I got another case here we'll open up and look at. Okay, so this is from uh, Judge Baldwin in a case called Baines versus the Schooner James and Catherine. Two Fed uh, uh, case 27, case number 756 in 1832. And I thought, whoop, whoop, whoop. I still got you. Sorry about that. Told you I wasn't professional. <laughs> yeah, you're 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 uh, risking your life here. But there is no middle ground on which to place such jurisdiction when we once break over the line which restrained it by acts of parliament. Remember, this came here from England when we settled here and prohibitions. We are necessarily thrown back on the civil law and the royal prerogative for the rules and principles on which the right of trial by jury depends. It is vain to contend that the Seventh Amendment will be any efficient guarantee for this right in suits at common law if an admiralty jurisdiction exists in the United States, commensurate with what is claimed by the claimant in this case. Its assertion is, in my opinion, a renewal of the contest between legislative power and royal prerogative. The common and the civil law striving for mastery, the one to secure, the other to take away the trial by jury, and until the authoritative judgment of a higher court shall make it my duty to surrender my judgment to their decree, it will never be sanctioned by me. So what's what's old Judge Baldwin telling us here? Baldwin's telling us, uh, look, you guys, you have this choice. You're free in America. You can follow the common law or you can follow this commercial law under maritime and engage in commerce. It's your choice. But understand, if you go into commerce... Uh, you are giving up a lot of power and rights. Now, remember, if you if you go back and watch those previous videos, you're basically sucked into this now by consent through all these contracts, but you're a mere matter of regulation anyway because you don't own anything anymore. Remember, in common or natural law, you got to pay for stuff with substance like gold and silver coin. You've never paid a debt at law. You've only discharged debts in the commercial law, UCC, maritime, equity, and all that. So you don't have that lodial title. Remember, there were some videos where I did on lodial title versus legal, uh, the division of legal and equitable title where you have possession and use, and you've got to pay a tribute to your master who has the real title. Now, let's see what else we got here. I got a few more here. Let's see. Oh, this is a good one, too. This is uh, from... Uh, Judge Johnson, uh, concurring remarks in Ramsey versus Allegri, 1827. There's the case site there. He makes a couple of really good remarks here. He says, I concur with my brethren in sustaining the decree below, but cannot consent to place my decision upon the ground in which they have placed theirs. I think it is high time to check this silent and stealing progress of the Admiralty in acquiring jurisdiction to which it has no pretensions. Unfounded doctrines ought to at once be met and put down and dicta as well as decisions that cannot be bear examination ought not to be evaded and permitted to remain on the books, the records of the court decisions, to be com commented upon and acquiesced in by the courts of justice or to be read and respected by those whose opinions are to be formed upon those books. It affords facilities for giving an undue bias to public opinion. Ooh, wow. And I will add, of interpolating doctrines which belong not to the law, and he's referring to the common law there. I have now said a great deal on this subject, and I could have, have said less and discharge the duty which I feel I owe to the community. Oh, I'm sorry, I could not have said less, and discharge the duty which I feel I owe to the community. I am fortifying a weak point in the wall of the Constitution. Every advance of the Admiralty is a victory over the common law, 
a conquest gained upon the trial by jury. The principles upon which alone this suit could have been maintained are equally applicable to one half of the commercial contracts between citizen and citizen. And we are way more beyond that now. We're almost, a, we're probably near 100%. <laughs> Once establishes the rights here claimed, it may bring back with all the admiralty usurpations of the 15th century. In England, there exists a controlling power. But here, there is none. He's talking about, remember earlier, the, the common law courts and parliament restricted the admiralty to the high seas. But here in America, there is none. Congress has indeed given a power to issue prohibitions to a district court when transcending the limits of the admiralty jurisdiction. But who is to issue a prohibition to us, the judges? If we should ever be affected with a partiality for that jurisdiction, I therefore hold that we are under a peculiar obligation to restrain the admiralty jurisdiction within its proper limits. That in case of contracts, it has no jurisdiction at all in personam, except as incident to the exercise of its jurisdiction in rem. Now what this is, is rem means thing. So this is basically saying subject matter jurisdiction. Admiralty Maritime has the subject matter jurisdiction over commerce. How does it get jurisdiction over your person? By your consent through contract. And because what I don't agree here with Justice Johnson is, he's saying that the court should try to limit this. He's basically implying that Americans are kind of, we're ignorant of this, which we are, especially today. And he thought the court should step in and protect the people. Well, no, in a free country, who's responsible for protecting their own liberties, rights, and all that? The individual. So if you don't know about this stuff, that's on you, buddy. If you want to change things, you change it for yourself. Quit using the power of the vote through political manipulations to garner majority rule over your neighbors. You want to end the Fed? End the Fed. Close your bank accounts. Cancel your credit card. Stop banking. You want to get out of maritime law through policies of insurance? Practice strict liability and file bonds with your Secretary of State. Quit limiting your liability to a maritime contract. You want to, you want to conduct private business under the common law? You can do so. Quit engaging in commerce and, and, and public business, affecting a public interest, affecting a public opinion, where public policy sets the, sets the day. We read that earlier. Public opinion. You know, anything that affects the public, the king has absolute right to, to, to regulate and control because he's got to protect the safety and welfare of the public. You do things privately, the king doesn't have any authority. That's what common law was all about. But Americans stopped doing that. They stopped doing that. And that's very sad because that's where most of your inalienable rights come from. Let's see what else we got here. This is interesting too because, see, in the admiralty, the jury is just advisory. Okay, in a common law, a jury of a lodial homo liber, that was in a previous video, they decide both fact and law. They, they have the power of jury nullification, but not maritime law. The technical niceties of the common law are not regarded. A jury does not figure ordinarily in a trial of the admiralty suit. The verdict of the jury, merely advisory, and may be disregarded by the court, the rules of practice may be altered whenever found to be inconvenient or likely to embarrass the business of the court. A court of admiralty acts upon equitable principles. Now, so does common law. That's just kind of stating a redundant point that everybody should already know. Let me see. Okay. While in a narrow and restricted sense, the terms commerce or commercial and trade may be limited to the purchase and sale of exchange of goods and commodities. They may connote as well other occupations and other recognized 
forms of business enterprise which do not necessarily involve trading in merchandise. And although commerce includes traffic, that's an important, Canaanite trafficking, that's what commerce is, in this narrow sense, for more than a century, it has been judicially recognized that in a broad sense, it embraces every phase of commercial and business activity and intercourse. Ouch. Why? Because everybody decided to start becoming seamen in the admiralty law and employees in occupations and open businesses in the public stream of commerce and maritime law by contract and consent. So everybody did this. Everybody that's bitching, moaning, and complaining, you did it to yourselves. And here's uh, just a story in Delovio versus Boyd. He said, the next inquiry is what are properly to be deemed maritime contracts? So this was about a maritime contract case uh, in involving insurance. And we'll see happily in this particular, there's little room for controversy. All civilians and jurists agree that in this appellation are included among other things, charter parties, again, a lot of sea terms here, affreightments, mar marine hypothecations, contracts for maritime service, in the building, repairing, supplying, and navigating ships, contracts between part owners of ships, contracts and quasi-contracts respecting averages, contributions, and jettisons, and what is more material to our present purpose, policies of insurance. So any insurance you have is a maritime contract. It's that simple, kids. That has because the Admiralty Maritime has jurisdiction over insurance limited liability. Our basic responsibility in interpreting the Commerce Clause is to make certain that the power to govern intercourse among the states remains where the Constitution placed it. That power is held by this court from the beginning. It's vested in the Congress, available to, be, to exercise for the national welfare as Congress shall deem necessary. No commercial enterprise of any kind which conducts its activities across state lines has been held to be wholly beyond the regulatory power of Congress under the Commerce Clause. We cannot make an exception for the business of insurance. So again, insurance, maritime contracts. Okay, now let's look at Chaz Wolf Packing Company versus the Court of Industrial Relations of the State. 262 U.S. 522, 1923. First, the act declares that the preparation of human food is affected by it. Now, let me point something out here. Pay attention when I read through this. How many times you read the word public? Is affected by a public interest. And the power of the legislature so to declare and then regulate the business is established in. Second, the power to regulate a business affected with a public interest extends to fixing wages and terms of employment to secure continuity of operation. Businesses said to be clothed with a public interest, justifying some public regulation may be divided into three classes. One, those which are carried on under the authority of a public grant of privileges, which either expressly or impliedly imposes the affirmative duty of rendering a public service demanded by any member of the public. Such are the railroads, other common carriers, and public utilities. Two, certain occupations regarded as exceptional, the public interest, attaching to which, recognized from the earliest times, has survived the period of arbitrary laws by parliament or colonial legislatures for regulating all trades and callings. Such are those of the keepers of inns, hotels, motels, cabs, and grist mills, to name a few. A grist mill would be like, uh, you know, uh, Pillsbury, uh, you know, uh, General Mills, you know, anybody that's dealing with food. Like I said, food preparation up here, okay? And three, here's where 99% of the businesses fall into. Businesses which, though not public at their inception, may be fairly said to have risen to be such and have become subject in consequence to some government regulation. 
They have come to hold such a peculiar relation to the public that this is superimposed upon them in the language of the cases. The owner, by devoting his business to the stream of commerce, to the public use, I'm open for to the public, here's my public hours, in effect, grants the public an interest in that use and subjects himself to the public regulation to the extent of that interest, although the property continues to belong to its private owner, again, legal title, possession and use, use must be in accordance with the law and the necessities of the state because you got to pay those tributes because you don't really own it in a low deal and to be entitled to protection accordingly. So again, you still have a subject of property right because you do have a legal title to stuff, but that's where it ends, okay? So here's my editorial comments. Public business is commerce. Chambers of commerce in every little town in America, you know, you have, they're protecting commerce, okay? Public business is a commercial venture in the hopes of, for profit and gain, income. As a corporate member of the regulated U.S. economy, commerce, interstate and foreign commerce, putting the business under the civil laws, admiralty maritime jurisdiction via contract and commercial activity. A public business deals in negotiable instruments, the fifth planks, notes, checks, credit, as the consideration for the goods and services it sells. Public businesses contract for policies of insurance. Public business is open to the public, affecting a public interest. The goods and chattels in public business sells and uses to conduct business comes to the business through the stream of interstate commerce. So where does a businessman get everything he needs from interstate and foreign commerce? Everything, you know, in your store may say made in China, made in Taiwan, made, you know, if you live in Nebraska, maybe it says made in Florida or made in Texas, made in Vietnam. Who knows? That's all interstate and foreign commerce, kids. And it's all done by your consent and contract. And that puts your person into this jurisdiction. And this jurisdiction is where Congress has absolute authority dictatorial power. <laughs> the only thing that limits it is the other aspects of the Constitution and treaties, which ain't much. This is what people just fail to grasp. You did this to yourself. You can't blame the government. I'm going to show you Wickard versus Filburn. This was a great case back in the Depression, but the, the Supreme Court decided it in 1942. What basically what this case is, this was a wheat farmer that signed up for a subsidy program during the Depression, the government subsidy program. The terms and conditions of that contract were the terms of the subsidy program put in the act. Okay? And it's said you can't, and then the regulations that accompany it through the executive branch agency that's going to enforce this, that P Congress passed. It said you couldn't grow any more than so many acres of wheat. And then the government would guarantee a much higher price than what the, what the mar uh, fair market, the free market, was offering because of the depression. So basically the government was coming in, lifting up the prices. And remember what we saw earlier in that previous case under commerce and this public business regulation. The government can regulate prices and wages, minimum wage, all that. Okay. So now what happened here is this farmer said, well, I'll go ahead and grow this number of acres of wheat, but I'm going to grow a little more, but I'm not going to sell it to the government. I'm going to hold it back to feed my own geese and make my own bread and stuff like that. Eh, thanks for playing. You couldn't do that. He violated the terms of the contract. And then he bitch moaned and complained and said, well, you're violating my constitutional rights. No, we're not. This is contract. You don't have any rights here. <laughs> Okay, so it is well established by decisions of this court that the power to regulate commerce includes the power to regulate the prices at which commodities in that commerce are dealt in and practices affecting such prices. It is said, however, that this act forcing some farmers into the market to buy what they could provide for themselves is an unfair promotion of the markets and prices of specializing wheat growers. It is of the essence of regulation that it lays a restraining hand 
on the self-interest of the regulated and that advantages from the regulation commonly fall to others. The conflicts of economic interest between the regulated and those who advantage by it are wisely left under our system to the resolution by the Congress under its more flexible and reasonable legislative process. Such conflicts rarely lend themselves to judicial determination and with the wisdom, workability, of, or fairness of the plan of regulation, we have nothing to do. The appellees claim that the act works a deprivation of due process, even apart from its alleged retroactive effect, is not persuasive. Control of total supply upon which the whole statutory plan is based. The government was going to control all of the prices of wheat to make sure it was fair and equitable across the board within the stream of commerce. Depends upon the control of individual supply. The appellee's claim is not that his quota represented less than a fair share of the national quota, but that the Fifth Amendment requires that he be free from penalty for planting wheat and disposing of his crop as he sees fit. Remember, he grew more wheat and wanted to keep it for himself and not sell it into the subsidies program into the controlled and regulated flow of commerce. And the court's saying, you can't do that, partner. You signed up for this program. We do not agree in its effort to control total supply. The government gave the farmer a choice, which was, of course, designed to encourage cooperation. We want you to engage in commerce, buddy. Come on, join us in this good ship USS economy. Come on. And discourage non-cooperation. Well, if you didn't sign up for the program, you could grow a million acres of wheat if you owned a million acres. We can't stop you. You can do with what you want, but we're not going to subsidize the price. You're going to have to sell that wheat at the free market price because you're dealing in the free market. This is our regulated and controlled market. You see the difference, kids? You are so wrapped up in commerce. You think that's a free market? That is a totally regulated and controlled economy of the United States. Now here, this is really important. We can hardly find a denial of due process, common law rights, in these circumstances, particularly since it is even doubtful that the appellee's burdens under the government program outweigh his benefits. It is hardly lack of due process for the government to regulate that which it subsidizes. You get a bailout check recently, you've just been subsidized. You get Social Security, you've been subsidized. You go to public school, you've been subsidized. <laughs> and you are regulated to death. Bum, 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 bum. Follow that? Now when you go into the court, remember that property or regulation? That's the only question. Are you dealing with a right of property? Are you dealing with a mere matter of regulation and commerce? And most people come in there thinking, I got constitutional rights. I got common law rights. I got an inalienable right. And the judge is looking to see if you got a property claim here. And there isn't one. And what he sees is a mere rat matter of regulation in the stream of commerce due to a contract that you signed. Or some quasi-adhesion contract with the government for a subsidy program. You see how this works, kids? They have brought you into a neo-feudal serfdom as a human resource in the stream of commerce engaged in an occupation for income. And they can totally regulate and control you. Totally regulate and control you. Now here's another good one. We'll kind of move on here a little bit. But surely this doctrine, this is from uh, Justice Story back in uh, Delovio versus Boyd again. But surely this doctrine cannot be true, for it is perfectly clear that the admiralty from the highest antiquity, what they're arguing about here is, does is the admiralty a court of record? Like a common law court? 
Of course it is. Of course it is. Has exercised a very extensive criminal jurisdiction and punished offenses by fine and imprisonment. The celebrated Inquisition at Queensboro in the reign of Edward III would alone be decisive. And even at common law, it has been adjudged that the admiralty might fine for contempt. As to the other reason for it not being a court of record, vis-a-vis -vis that it proceeds according to the course of the civil law, and that an appeal and not a writ of error lies from its decrees. They have nothing to do with the question for whether a court of record or does not or does not not depend upon the form of proceeding in any court. Now, we just kind of let the rest of that go. The important part here is see he's distinguishing between the procedures within whether you're in a common law court with a jury or you got the Seventh Amendment right of a trial by jury. Remember those earlier cases we just read a little bit ago about the maritime law. You know, you come into this contract where it has subject matter jurisdiction, and now because you've agreed and consented, now it has impersona jurisdiction, you've lost your right to the Seventh Amendment right of trial by trial of jury, where the jury, remember we read earlier, that you could have a jury, but it's going to be advisory. The court can say, ah, eh, we don't have to listen to you. And that's happened several times, and people go, oh, they get all freaked out. Doesn't happen much, but it does happen sometimes. Now here's another one. One of the procedures of a maritime admiralty court is an appeal. And in the common law courts, a writ of error. So when you go and file an appeal, uh, what's that telling the judge? <laughs> is that a common law action? Is this, this, is this a procedure in the common law court or is that an, a procedure within the maritime jurisdiction? You starting to see this picture here, kids? So, let's see. I think we can get rid of that. We did that. We did that. Oh, no, we didn't. There we go. Hale versus Hinkle. This will be the last one. Hopefully, we got enough room here on this memory stick. Hale versus Hinkle. This is in 1906. We are of the opinion. Again, this is a Supreme Court, 201 U.S. 43. We are of the opinion that there is a clear distinction in this particular between an individual and a corporation. And that the latter has no right to refuse to submit its books and papers for an examination at the suit of the state. The individual may stand upon his constitutional rights as a citizen. He is entitled to carry on his private business ooh, in his own way. His power to contract is unlimited. He owes no duty to the state or to his neighbors to divulge his business or to open his doors to an investigation so far as it may tend to incriminate him. He owes no such duty to the state since, this is important, that's why it's in green and big bold letters, since he receives nothing therefrom beyond the protection of his life and property. His rights are such as existed by the law, common law of the land, long antecedent to the organization of the state and can only be taken from him by due process of law or contract. You can consent to give them away and in accordance with the Constitution. Among his rights are refusal to incriminate himself and to immunity of himself and his property from arrest or seizure except under a warrant of the law. He owes nothing to the public so long as he does not trespass upon their rights. So, uh, he received nothing therefrom. How many of you have received a public school education? Did you get that from the state? How many of you received a marriage license from the state and sanctioned your marriage through a three-party general contract through the state where the state's the superior party? How many of you have a driver's license with the state? How many of you have a social security number with the United States? How many of you are using that social security number for benefit purposes, like an employee ID or taxpayer ID number so you can get employed in the stream of commerce in an occupation earning fifth plank central bank credit as your as income? How many of you have, you know, 
I mean, go on and go on. How many of you have student loans through the, through the government? Grants. How many of you received subsidies through the government, like unemployment benefits? How many of you received bailouts from economic hardness and accepted those benefits and deposited them into your into your checking account when you received the check? Or hell, probably just go and direct deposit. So, do you receive nothing from the state, or do you receive everything from the state? Hmm. You're engaged in corporate capacity, kids. You're not an individual. You're a corporate member, and you're engaged in corporate capacity. If you're walking like a duck, talking like a duck, and quacking like a duck, you must be a duck. Upon the other hand, the corporation is a creature of the state. It's presumed to be incorporated for the benefit of the public. It receives certain special privileges and franchises and holds them subject to the laws of the state and the limitations of its charter. Its powers are limited by that law. It can make no contract not authorized by its charter. Its rights to act as a corporation are only preserved to it so long as it obeys the laws of its creation. Artificial person created by the state. Okay. I don't need to go further. That's that's a pretty good case. You ought to go read it. Hale versus Hinkle, 201 U.S. 43. All right. Now remember, you don't own anything. I'm going to bring that back up again. Let's see if I can find that real quick. Seventy third Congress, first session, Senate document number 43, April of 1933. The ultimate ownership of all property is in the state. Individual so-called ownership is only by virtue of government, i.e. law, amounting to mere user, and use must be in accordance with the law and subordinate to the necessities of the state. You have a mere title to, title to possession and use. You do not have a lodial title. You're not homo liber. You're not a free man, an allodial proprietor. You are a neo-feudal serf under contract to various forms of commercial law because of everything that you choose to do out of your own ignorance. And that's why that jurisdiction and the power of Congress has been expanded and enlarged by numerous enactments as we read in the very first document there from Amjur about Admiralty. Because you choose to do this. You ex choose to expand the maritime law because that's the only thing you know. You don't know how to conduct private business. If you keep watching these series, I may go into some details about how you might start to do those things and return to a status that is more like a free man. Unfortunately, you're not going to be able to be completely free because they've hypothecated everything as collateral on that debt, but you can be a lot freer than you are today. I appreciate you watching. Remember, I'm not a professional videographer or YouTuber. I'm just a guy concerned about how lost you are and I'm trying to give you some information and, and for you to use this is not legal advice this is just to help you get a little more aware of what you've done to yourself i thank you for watching peace god bless